Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this afternoon's webinar, Seizing the Opportunity, Climate Investments in West Virginia's Future Economy. My name is Stephanie Gagnon, and I'm an Associate Policy Fellow at C2ES. I will begin with a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, if you can go to that slide. This webinar is being recorded, and a recording will be posted on the C2ES YouTube page within 24 hours following the webinar. You'll also receive a link in the follow-up email from Zoom webinar. Throughout the presentation, we will or the conversation, we will be taking questions. You can submit those directly through the Q and A box in Zoom webinar. That looks like a little uh, speech bubble shaped Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to get to everyone's questions in our Q and A portion of the panel discussion. But feel free to submit your questions at any time throughout the webinar. You can keep the conversation going by following us on social media. We have Facebook and LinkedIn as well as Twitter. You can find us there at at c two e s underscore o r g. Today, I'm going to open with an introduction to the Roundtable project and cover some highlights from our newly released brief with findings and recommendations from our Morgantown Roundtable. The full report, which we released this morning, can be found today on our website at c2es.org library, or it can be found through our direct link at bit.ly wv-brief. That's a little bit easier. If you click it, it'll be in the chat uh, through Zoom. After my presentation, I'll turn to Brad Townsend, who's our Vice President for Strategy and Outreach, and he'll introduce the panel. Next slide. If this is your first webinar with us, welcome. I'll start by taking a moment to introduce our organization. The Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, also known as C2ES, is a nonpartisan nonprofit think tank with the goal of advancing strong policy and ambitious action to both reduce greenhouse gas emissions, promote and accelerate the clean energy transition, strengthen adaptation and resilience to climate impacts, and also to facilitate the necessary financial investments to do so. Through our Climate Innovation 2050 initiative, we engage our Business Environmental Leadership Council, as well as additional companies, to pursue the goals of economic growth and decarbonization across the U.S. economy by 2050. With our regional roundtable program, we've spent the past two years hosting roundtables virtually in cities around the country, where we engage a variety of local stakeholders on relevant issues. We hope to elevate the perspectives of these local stakeholders, including policymakers at all levels of government, businesses of all sizes, community organizations and trade associations, as well as leading academics and issue experts, investors, and philanthropy. We hope to create opportunities to integrate these local perspectives into state and federal policy contexts and to emerge with concrete steps to align long-term growth with economy-wide decarbonization. Next slide. We went virtually, unfortunately because of the pandemic, to West Virginia, noting that it's a major historic supplier of US energy. Throughout most of the 20th century, coal from West Virginia powered much of the US and the global grid. But as companies and governments are pursuing opportunities to decarbonize, it's central to address challenges of coal dependent communities to deal with a climate challenge. At the same time, there's tremendous hope among emerging low carbon industries and then opportunities to take advantage of this accelerating shift toward low carbon investment. So our roundtable discussion, which was held virtually over two days in June in Morgantown, focused on the evolution of domestic and global markets. On the first day, we discussed West Virginia's strengths and the role infrastructure can play in attracting private investment. On the second day, we got into how policymakers can help industries and workers prepare for new opportunities. Next slide, please. From our conversation, there emerged several themes surrounding the state's assets, as well as the barriers to being able to take advantage of those assets. Within assets, there were three distinct areas, workforce, natural resources, and proximity to demand centers. Speaking about workforce, West Virginia is home to highly skilled workers in the energy, chemicals, manufacturing sectors, as well as a vibrant forestry and agricultural sector. Many workers in these industries possess highly transferable skills that can position them well to lead in emerging low carbon industries. For natural resources, West Virginia is home to meaningful potential for wind, solar, hydroelectric, and geothermal generation. It also has many significant sources of forest carbon for both carbon sequestration as well as sustainable biomass. And it also has many natural gas reserves which can be used to produce hydrogen fuel or when paired with carbon capture utilization and storage to produce energy. Finally, West Virginia is in close proximity to demand centers. And by this, we mean that it has access to highly populated urban centers across the Midwest, Mid-Atlantic, and Southeast, which make it well-suited to serve as a hub for low-carbon manufacturing or fuels. However, many of our participants also identified several barriers. 
Namely, the small and geographically dispersed population of West Virginia is a major challenge. This is essentially because a lot of communities have very low population density, it's hard to provide physical infrastructure to reach all of the population. And at the same time, small communities have oftentimes have low administrative capacity. So even when there is federal funding available, it can be difficult for these communities to take advantage of it because a lot of these programs are focused on metrics that prioritize urban development and may not take into account factors surrounding rural development. An additional challenge that kind of relates to this is its mountainous physical geography, which makes it difficult to build new and maintain existing physical infrastructure. In particular, our participants identified this as a challenge for implementing digital infrastructure and bringing broadband to all of the residents. Another challenge that came up quite a lot in our roundtable was the availability of low, low carbon power in the state. As many companies look to site their operations and at the same time they have their own decarbonization goals that they're looking to find, low, find sources of low carbon power, they need access to low carbon sources of energy in order to choose places to site their facilities. Finally, many participants identified regulatory uncertainty as a barrier. West Virginia at the state level lacks a strong regulatory framework to support the development of emerging industries. Things like carbon capture utilization and storage, geothermal energy, and even renewables. Many of these long-term projects require certainty in the long run, which is something that a strong regulatory framework can provide. Next slide, please. From the roundtable discussion, as well as subsequent discussions with additional stakeholders, we identified a series of policy recommendations that kind of fell into three different areas, infrastructure needs, sectoral opportunities, and workforce. I'm going to spend the next few minutes going into at a high level many of these recommendations, but if you want to go deeply into the recommendations or read the full brief, you can find that again on our website. The link is in the chat in Zoom. It's also, you can get there directly by going to bit.ly slash wv brief. Next slide, please. On infrastructure needs, our participants identified the need to support local capacity to fix and build new infrastructure. As I mentioned earlier with the challenge of a low population density, which is especially challenging in areas that have low median incomes, it can be difficult for many communities in West Virginia to take advantage of federal infrastructure funding opportunities. So our participants recommended adjusting federal loan and grant programs to focus on accessibility for smaller communities. This can be through things like reducing cost share requirements. At the same time, we also recommend including provisions directly in those grant programs to support building up that local capacity. This can be through things like administrative grants and other forms of funding. Another recommendation we had was to provide a robust broadband infrastructure network for all residents. As we've learned from the pandemic, access to reliable broadband is essential. But as I mentioned earlier, the low population density and challenging geography of the state make it hard to reach everyone without dedicated federal and state support. So we recommend federal and state actions to support deploying broadband infrastructure with a focus on coal dependent communities and especially areas with low population density where it may not otherwise be economically feasible. <clears throat> Third, we recommend expanding funding for community development financial institutions, also known as CDFIs, which can spur investment in climate mitigation and resilience projects. CDFIs, if you haven't heard of them before, leverage federal funds alongside private capital to offer financing to individual borrowers or small businesses or even community organizations. These can be effective vectors for investment in low carbon infrastructure as well as climate resilience projects, and they can be especially effective in smaller rural communities. So we recommended directing more federal funding toward regional CDFIs by putting emphasis on decarbonization and climate resilience projects. Finally, a main infrastructure recommendation was around low carbon transportation infrastructure. We heard this a lot in the discussion. The main infrastructure needs of the state are often in the forms of repairing roads and bridges where West Virginia has a huge repair backlog, but there was a huge interest in supporting low carbon infrastructure and a huge opportunity to support companies in their efforts to decarbonize their supply chains by expanding funding for things like freight rail or zero emission freight trucking. At the same time, our participants also, I, excuse me, our participants also emphasized the need for federal funding for charging and refueling infrastructure throughout the state. This is things like EV chargers for both passenger and freight infrastructure, as well as hydrogen refueling stations. Uh, here, we should note it's also key to make more low carbon power available to support this charging. Next slide, please. In terms of sectoral opportunities, 
Our participants identified opportunities in the carbon capture industry, as well as manufacturing of low carbon products, and then the circular economy. I'll go kind of quickly through this. Um, so in terms of carbon capture utilization and sequestration, also known as CCUS, West Virginia was identified as an option to be a strong player in this space, but it does need support at the federal level through permitting and financial support like tax credits. Um, at the same time, this challenge of a strong state level regulatory framework that I mentioned earlier comes into play. Looking at manufacturing low carbon products, this is things like inputs for renewable energy, EVs, other low carbon products. Um, we specifically recommended reinstating and expanding the 48C manufacturing investment tax credit, which was initially created in 2009 under the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. This would support constructing new facilities as well as retooling existing facilities. Here, our participants also identified the powerful opportunity to take advantage of brownfields, where there's a lot of infrastructure that already exists and is already connected to the power grid. Finally, on the circular economy, which came up frequently in the discussion, we often discuss the context of waste reduction, chemical recycling, et cetera, especially given how well the state is positioned to supply regional high demand centers with input materials or recycled products. And here again, brownfields came up in this context as an opportunity to revitalize existing infrastructure and equipment. Next slide, please. Workforce was a popular topic of discussion throughout the roundtable, and most of the discussion focused on training and remote work. In terms of training, there was a high need to align employer needs with workforce training programs. Many companies that were represented in the roundtable identified that jobs that had once required more trade skills now also require IT and software skills. So we recommend that the federal and state governments work together to facilitate partnerships between employers and training programs. And at the same time, this can provide workers with opportunities while making sure that those train, training programs are filling practical employer needs. Finally, as we've all learned over the past 18 months, remote work is a huge opportunity. So this came up quite frequently in the discussion on two sides of this coin. One, it can be very attractive for workers who are working remotely in urban areas around the country who want to take advantage of a lower cost of living or be closer to outdoor recreation, which West Virginia has a lot to offer. Um, so attracting these workers that already have remote jobs to come live in West Virginia is an excellent opportunity. At the same time, it also presents an opportunity for workers that already live in West Virginia to take advantage of opportunities outside the state and work remotely without having to move. This does raise the challenge of needing to make sure that broadband and strong physical infrastructure are kept up. Next slide. With that, I will make one more push to check out our full policy brief on the C2 Guest website. You know where to find the link. Uh, and I'll also remind you that we'll be taking questions at the end of the discussion, so you can submit those at any time through the Q&A box. Thank you so much for your time. I'll turn it now over to Brad, our Vice President of Strategy and Outreach, to introduce our fantastic panel and moderate the discussion. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, and hello, everybody. Thanks for, for taking the time to join us this afternoon. I'd also like to say thank you to the, the dozens of stakeholders uh, who attended the June Roundtable, a number of whom I know are also watching this webinar, so welcome and thank you. Uh, those participants, uh, I, I guess I should note actually also a thank you to the participants who helped us to, to really refine the brief, including the recommendations that, that Stephanie has outlined. Uh, we really hope everyone will have a chance to read it. Uh, of course, uh, just to dispense with, I think, the, the elephant in the webinar and or digital room, obviously there is a lot of attention uh, on West Virginia in this moment, and in particular, Senator Manchin uh, here in DC. And so sort of given that, we want to obviously acknowledge that we hope the this discussion and the brief will inform some of the broader thinking on the Hill right now about the kinds of investments that are needed to accelerate a transition to a sustainable and prosperous net zero economy. But it would also be a mistake to only view this discussion through that lens. Uh, there is, I think, sometimes a tendency, which will surprise no one uh, who works uh, in and around D.C., but to really forget that the rest of the country isn't always as focused on, on sort of the day-to-day -day, uh, conversations that we are having. And really, that's been, I think, a, a focal point for us in terms of, of actually uh, launching this effort around regional roundtables, uh, which, as Stephanie mentioned, we've been hosting since April 2020, really to help us develop a better understanding of the ways in which the transition is affecting and will affect communities around the country. So we've had a chance to learn uh, a lot from, from folks, not only in Morgantown, 
but also in Houston, Chicago, Des Moines, Columbus, and Phoenix about their unique challenges, the future they want for themselves, the strengths they bring to a low carbon future, uh, and particularly uh, economic uh, assets, and also the opportunities they see for themselves in the transition. And really in every case, what we learned has helped us to identify not only uh, takeaways that resonate in cities and states across the country, there's certainly I think a lot of, of sort of shared challenges, uh, but also to really shine a light on the things that, that make each of those communities unique and will shape the sort of unique transition that, that each will, will need to undergo uh, through the course of the, the transition to a net zero economy. And so regardless of what is happening in DC today or this week or even this month, that's a conversation worth having on its own. Uh, and we're delighted to have uh, three people with us today who've been at the forefront of this transition in West Virginia, and they have a lot of, of, uh, of informative perspective to offer us. Uh, we'll have a, a, a bit of a discussion uh, among, uh, sort of a moderated discussion among uh, the panelists and I, uh, and then we'll also, as Stephanie noted, have some time for Q&A at the end. Please feel free to submit your questions. I think we've already got one, uh, one in the queue here, so that's great. Um, as we go, and uh, we'll we'll dive right into the the conversation here. Uh, I'd like to to take just a quick moment uh, before we do to introduce uh, our our panelists. Uh, so first, we have Kelly Bragg, uh, who is a, a graduate of Marshall University. Uh, Kelly has more than thirty years of experience uh, in fields ranging from journalism to marketing, energy program development, and administration. Uh, as an energy development specialist with the West Virginia Office of Energy. Her focus areas are renewable energy, energy efficiency, and alternative fuels and vehicles. Uh, she is deeply versed in financial and contract management, program leadership, event planning, writing, editing, research, knowledge transfer, and grant writing. Uh, she, she can do it all. Uh, and to that point, she also performs uh, as an alto with Women Strong Corral, the only all-female community choir in West Virginia. Uh, so thanks, Kelly, for being on. Um, our, our second panelist uh, is Sam Taylor. Uh, Sam uh, has worked in the development, uh, management, and oversight of renewable and non-renewable energy research activities since 2001. Uh, he's directly managed research development and deployment programs, totaling more than a billion dollars for both West Virginia University and the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, in his role at the, at the Energy Institute, Sam is focused on uh, the development of major research investments and initiatives that can leverage the cross-cutting strengths and partnerships uh, at WVU to high impact outcomes. So he's got a, a technical focus in large scale grid, carbon management, natural gas production and utilization, transportation energy utilization and energy geosciences. Uh, Sam also has a strong uh, interest in uh, economic and workforce development issues, especially as they relate to energy development and technological change in the region. Uh, not, not to be outdone uh, by Kelly's vocal skills, uh, Sam also enjoys playing outside in the woods um, and is an avid mountain biker, rock climber, and photographer. Uh, our, our last uh, speaker is Delegate Evan Hansen. Um, Delegate Hansen was elected to the West Virginia House of Delegates in 2018 and 2020, uh, again, reelected, uh, where he serves as a member of the Energy and Manufacturing Committee uh, and uh, also the Coal Community Work Group. Uh, he founded Downstream Strategies in 1997 and serves as its president uh, offering consulting services uh, to help build resilient communities, promote economic development, and protect the environment. Delegate Hansen has more than 30 years of experience consulting for government agencies, nonprofit organizations, attorneys, private businesses, and individuals on issues related to energy and water science and policy. Uh, he's got a, a BS in computer science and engineering from MIT uh, and a, an MS in energy and resources from UC Berkeley. Uh, and so with that, uh, I am going to uh, to kick off the discussion with a question to Kelly. Um, and so uh, Kelly, the obviously there's been a lot of conversation uh, about West Virginia's reliance on coal to power, not just its its grid, right, but also its economy writ large. But but maybe a little bit less about what those the opportunities might look like moving forward. From your vantage point, what are some of the strengths that West Virginia brings to a low carbon future? Great, great question. First of all, I want to um, thank C2ES for uh, having us do this uh, webinar. And thanks to everybody who's online and is curious about these topics. Um, one of the things I'm really, really fond of is knowledge transfer and the ability to do stuff like this gets us all thinking. And, and that is really the only way forward. Um, 
So to start off with about some of our assets that people may or may not know about, a couple of years ago, pumped storage uh, hit the, the headlines all over the world. And I started getting questions from my bosses. Can we do that here? I didn't know. So I reached out to people who, who could tell me, and that turned out to be the West Virginia Geological and Economic Survey. And um, they developed a methodology, which is well worth, if you ever read the paper, just figuring out you know, which, which areas of the state to foco focus on, which mine pools, et cetera. And they came up with the idea of looking at paired mine pools that um, could hold a million gallons of water each, you know, each, well, a million gallons of water. What we found was that the structure of these underground mines could not take the back and forth of that much water. So, you know, that was sort of a, a yes, we don't, we, we cannot do this here. But what they recommended was using the water underground um, to heat and cool um, using geothermal power industries and towns, et cetera, who, that were nearby. Um, so then we engaged um, Marshall University's Center for Business and Economic Research to take a look at that, focusing in a little more. And within their study, which I'm still in the process of reading, is showing that uh, it's it's showing that the best locations and also has a layer that shows um, industrial sites, cities, uh, hospitals, et cetera, who might be able to benefit from that. Our next step is going to be a more focused engineering study to kind of nail that down. Um, so that's geothermal. Wind uh, here, as most of you know, is a mature industry here. Um, we do have some ridge tops that don't yet aren't yet built out for wind. Um, but I really think that um, all, most of our capacity is built out and what we're going to be seeing in the future is repowers where the, um, the height of the turbines and the, the longer blades are installed. It is hard to, to, to uh, get those, those large pieces of equipment up our mountains as you know, we've talked a little bit about the geography here. But I would like to point out that all of our um, wind projects are built on reclaimed surface mines. I don't think a lot of people know that. I get calls saying, you know, oh, why are they tearing up that mountain to put up that turbine? It's like, well, it already was. It already was. Um, hydro is uh, probably a no, I would say, um, as far as uh, more. Um, is that what I wrote there? Let me see. Probably no for now, I guess. I'm, I'm only skeptical of hydro because if your source is glacial, um, and, and as we have the planet warms, you know, we're going to have less of a reliance on that. I was talking earlier to the other panelist about um, a native West Virginian named Lonnie Simpson, and he and his wife did some really incredible work on um, glaciers in the Andes, which have as their source, you know, uh, that's glacial water. So as the planet warms, you know, so many people are dependent on that for electricity and, and drinking water that it, it, it's really a problem. And Lonnie actually did this work, um, some core drilling on glaciers that no longer exist in the Andes. Um, so that brings me to, I would have to say my favorite uh, asset of West Virginia, and that is energy efficiency. Um, what we like to think about that is as embodied energy, because um, these buildings have, like I said, there are, they've already been built, they've already used energy to be built, they're still here. Some of them maybe need to be torn down, but others can be retrofitted. And the beauty of that is that these are sites that don't move. The jobs cannot be outsourced. Um, people in West Virginia could be trained or retrained to, to actually do this work. And if, if we went through and retrofitted every single building in West Virginia, then what we get is um, a, a more efficient building stock that can handle rooftop solar. Um, so your systems would be smaller, your buildings would be more efficient, and that not only saves you on your, on your bills, it also makes your arrays smaller. Um, one thing about solar, a lot of people ask me, well, gosh, do we even have enough sun here in West Virginia? We do. We have four hours of insulation average um, throughout the year, which is the equivalent to Germany. Um, and, and Germany, as you all may know, was a leader in solar um, a couple years back. They, they ran into some policy hurdles, which 
a lot of the stuff that's going on in the world, West Virginia can benefit from the people who went before. And so I think it's, it's uh, interesting to look at it from, from that perspective. And I think that sort of wraps up the idea on assets other, other than our people are a great asset. We, I would say as a group, we definitely want to succeed and we definitely want to be um, transferred to a clean energy economy and uh, hopefully we can get there. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. And uh, before, before I turn to the next question, I would just ask uh, either uh, Delegate Hansen or Sam if you had anything that you wanted to add uh, to Kelly's comments there. Okay. All right. Well, Sam. Uh, oh, I, maybe you're muted. Go ahead. No, you're you're good. I I thought that you know Kelly was on point with those responses, and you know, and I'd like to echo uh, what she said at the top there. You know, thank you guys for convening uh, the roundtable a couple months ago for putting the report together. You know, Stephanie was reading through the high level findings. Uh, I just found myself you know nodding. Yeah, that's. Yep, that, that's a barrier. Yep, that's an opportunity. So, so I think it's a, a really nice piece of work and a really nice summary of a lot of discussions um, that we had back at the roundtable. So, so thank you all for that. Thanks, Sam. Well, I'll, I'll uh, unless uh, Delegate Hansen has any, any comments there, I'll, I'll pivot and actually a question for you. Um, there's obviously been a lot of conversation about green jobs. I think, uh, unfortunately, a lot of that conversation tends to happen in the abstract. Uh, sometimes people don't always know what those jobs look like, um, sort of beyond, you know, the obvious. And so I know, I know you've done a lot of thinking about this, uh, in terms of specific opportunities and industries that, that could really grow in the state. Can you give us a sense of where you think the biggest opportunities for, for low carbon industries and technologies, uh, is for West Virginia? Yeah, sure thing, Brad. So, so I would say that, you know, Part of the, the context in that is we think about how you, you do job creation in the state is, is West Virginians, you know, in my research, I've talked about how West Virginians tend to be sticky. Uh, folks that are that are from West Virginia want to stay in West Virginia. They've got family or community ties to the place. So as you think about, you know, you know, job transition, industrial transition, you have a workforce that has skills and has incentive to stay put. You know, you don't necessarily have to think about how we import, you know, how do we attract folks from all over the country if we have those skills in the neighborhood. So I think a lot of times when you, when you talk green jobs, the, the thinking tends to immediately just jump out to, we're going to do solar installs everywhere. We're going to do wind installs everywhere. And I do think there's a component of that here, but I'll be a little bit of a contrarian and say that that may not be the largest opportunity that we have. I think in, in West Virginia, there's a, a lot of opportunity. And it's something Stephanie mentioned at the top around you know, low carbon manufacturing, um, carbon to chemicals type work, carbon to fuels, where we have a, you know, a, a workforce that's already experienced in that space. And we're just bringing new technology, new feedstocks, uh, you know, to the table. I think another one that's, you know, I'm personally interested in, and we have some research here at the university, is in some of these, you know, the things we do in the subsurface. So, you know, West Virginia has a long history of work in the subsurface, you know, between coal and natural gas. And now we're able to take some of that expertise and pivot it into work uh, in geothermal, which we have quite a bit of interest in. And, and uh, Kelly mentioned some geothermal work that they're doing around, you know, sort of mon pool, which is lower temperature. Uh, some of the stuff we're looking at is trying to get way higher in temperature that we could start to use for industrial heat. And uh, there's, there's going to be a lot of overlap in workforce there, too. So, so a lot of the jobs bec become green jobs over time, um, you know, compared to maybe where they're standing now. But the skill sets are really portable and the technologies we're trying to deploy already have some application in other industries. Uh, so I, in my opinion, you know, again, that's, that's where I think maybe more than just pure energy production is in some of the surrounding industries. It, because even back in the, you know, in the, in the coal days, you know, we had huge, huge work around the, the coal sector. Not all of that work was in mining coal. There was a lot of jobs that were built out in the, you know, machining and manufacturing and support services. And so starting to think about how we can start to extend into those industries as well becomes really important. So uh, just a, a quick follow up there. You know, we talked about this in, in the brief a little bit as well in terms of proximity to demand centers. Yep. How, how big of an advantage is that? I mean, 
for us, it's huge. Um, you know, the, the shorter you have to transport stuff, things we've seen, you know, in the last 18 months with COVID, um, you know, the closer you can have your, your supply, you know, to your manufacturing and to your customer, you know, possibly, probably the better you're going to be. Um, that also has secondary benefits when you start to think about, you know, carbon footprint and energy efficiency of these things, you know, not, not necessarily shipping stuff. You know, there, there are a lot of things in our supply chain that are maybe being mined in the U.S. and then they're being shipped to Southeast Asia and upgraded and shipped back across the Pacific in, you know, some finished good that then gets upgraded to a final product here. And there's a lot of opportunity uh, to, to gain efficiency and to, you know, to reduce impact in, you know, domestic and localizing your supply chains. So for us, that's fantastic. I mean, with the population on the East Coast, uh, that, you know, be, being close, as they say, you know, location is everything in real estate, but it's, it's good for us too. So. Yeah. yeah, I think that was something that that we heard, you know, from companies during the roundtable, right, was that yeah. they're especially given some of the supply chain issues that we've seen over the last 12 to 18 months that the need for onshoring uh, really becomes a, an area of focus for folks. So again, I think we we'll just echo it. Does it obviously struck us as a big opportunity for the state? Um, yep. In, in that conversation, thanks, um, if Kelly or or Delegate Hanson. If you have anything you wanted to add to to Sam's comments there, I'll give you just a second there. But um, I'll, I'll maybe I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah, please. Uh, you know, I think with the the expected influx of dollars that we expect, um, what's different about this stimulus that we're expecting over the one that was mentioned by I think Stephanie earlier, is that you know we had to spend the money quickly the last time. This time we have a longer lead time, so we can say to manufacturers, "Hey, we're going to need." 14 million solar panels in the next five years, you know, because here's this, this influx of money coming. So that, that gives us an opportunity to say, bring it back. We'll buy it. You know, so I just want to kind of drop that in there. Yeah. Thanks. That's a great point. And, and maybe a, a, a great segue actually um, to, to delegate Hansen, uh, just understanding that you, I think, have been at, at really the center of a lot of conversations uh, in the West Virginia State House and have done a lot of work to try to enact policy, uh, like some of the, the investments that, that Kelly mentioned, to really try to boost some of these technologies. I would love to hear from you sort of what, what kinds of policies you'd like to see at either the state or federal level uh, to help drive that and, and what you think uh, it, it would do in terms of impact for communities across the state. Sure, and first, let me say thank you for hosting this and having us as panelists and apologies for dropping off there for a minute. Even in Morgantown, we have internet issues, but I got back just in time. Um, at, the, at the federal level, I think everybody who's following following the news knows that there's the infrastructure bill and the reconciliation package, and there's all sorts of things that are hopefully in, but may or may not be in one or both of those bills that are important for West Virginia. So, you know, some examples of things that are, are very important for the energy transition are uh, the, the money that's set aside, the billions of dollars for abandoned mine land and orphan well reclamation, talking about oil and gas wells, because we have so much work that still needs to be done here in West Virginia. And you know that ties in with some of the, the new economy that's being built here based on tourism and remote work, making this a better place to live and a better place to, to play. Um, tied to the abandoned mine land issue is the reauthorization of the abandoned mine reclamation fee, which actually expired last week. Uh, but that needs to be reauthorized so that the cost of remediating those sites is, is borne as much as possible by the industry that's, that's causing the issues. I mean, the polluter pays principle is only fair. Um, there, there's a, a provision that was mentioned at the beginning uh, by Stephanie, the 48C tax credits. And these are tax credits that would spur new energy manufacturing jobs. And uh, the, Senator Manchin has played a key role in that debate. He, he's proposed that a certain amount of those credits be uh, set aside for 
community is hardest hit by the loss of coal mining jobs and, and coal-fired power plant jobs. Um, unfortunately, the current draft of that uh, does not have that set aside in it, but I'm hoping that that can be placed back in the bill by the time it's ultimately voted on. Um, something else important for West Virginia in federal policy is electric vehicle infrastructure. We have so few charging stations, appropriate charging stations in West Virginia that I think we're losing, we're losing tourism dollars and people are avoiding our highways because they're, they don't feel like they could reliably charge their vehicles. And something else that would help in that space would be electric school buses and electrifying the school bus fleet. That's something important, not just um, to, well, that's important for human health as well uh, because kids are impacted by diesel exhaust. And the last thing I'll mention in terms of federal policy is one that Senator Manchin is also at the center of through his committee, but committee, but it's the, the CEPP or the SEP, which stands for a couple of different things. And it's basically pushing the, the transition um, toward renewables, utility by utility, providing incentives to shift and disincentives if they don't shift. And I think that's actually very important for West Virginia. I know there's differing opinions on that. But my opinion on that is, is that we're already feeling the brunt of this energy transition in West Virginia. And something like the SEP is gonna allow us to also share in the benefits because it will kind of level the playing field among states and direct a lot more clean energy jobs into West Virginia in terms of building and maintaining large solar arrays or like Kelly mentioned, repowering wind farms. And those will create good paying union jobs as well, which is really important for West Virginia. So that's all at the federal level. At, this, at the state level, I think it's important to recognize that despite all the, all, all the craziness that goes on at the Capitol, um, we do have some momentum. We've passed some good bills in the last couple of sessions that have made some real impacts, but they are really baby steps compared to what we need to do. Uh, we did remove a punitive tax on large solar arrays that's resulted in a lot more solar development. We've allowed electric utilities to build large scale solar arrays and offer electricity to businesses that need low carbon electricity. That's moving forward. Uh, we've set a target for energy efficiency in state buildings. So that's going to save taxpayer dollars. Uh, but there's a lot more we need to do. One thing that's on my mind a lot right now in Morgantown is we had some pretty severe floods, unprecedented floods over the summer. Um, and we need to be thinking more about how to invest in climate resilient infrastructure in West Virginia. That's something that a lot of states have done over the last decades, but we've done precious little of that here in West Virginia because it's been so difficult to even talk about climate change here. And to the extent that we could use ARPA funds and direct some of those towards stormwater infrastructure, that could get us started along that path. Um, and then also at the state level, we, we need policies that are going to allow our people to thrive in a low carbon future. And so one example is a bill that we're um, getting feedback on now to reuse sites that now have coal-fired power plants on them if and when those plants shut down. Can we reuse those sites to sustain power plant jobs and create construction jobs in the future? And then I'll just close by saying what's really powerful is when state and federal policies work together. And one place that's happening now is in a renewed effort to support coal and power plant communities. But at the federal level, there's the interagency working group on coal and power plant communities and economic revitalization. And they're working to um, direct a lot of money into communities, including those in West Virginia. And at the state level in the House, we have the House of Delegates Coal Community Work Group that's doing similar things. And there's actually going to be a series of listening sessions starting later this month that the Coal Community Work Group is hosting. And uh, I could uh, put those dates and information in the chat, but they're coming up in northern and southern West Virginia later this month. And what's it going to mean for communities across the state? Well, it's going to take time because this is a big 
big issue and a big transformation, but we're going to start to see more diversified economies. We're going to start to see people moving into West Virginia and not out of West Virginia. And that's going to happen because we're going to have state policies that, that better align economic development with environmental protection. So instead of always having this tension between the two, if we can align those, we're going to, we're going to do well. Thanks for that. And, and I want to offer uh, Kelly and Sam an opportunity to weigh in there as well. But I, I think one thing that I, I'm, I'm struck by, I was struck by during the round table, and I think uh, again today, just the sort of the sense of optimism, right? That, that this is not, uh, you know, I think there are a lot of caricatures, uh, I, I think un unfair uh, at this point that, that, you know, folks in West Virginia are not sort of, you know, don't want this transition to happen. And, and I don't get the sense, again, from either the roundtable or today's conversation so far that that's the case. I, I don't know if anybody would like to sort of further elaborate on that, just to kind of get a sense of, of where people are. I'll take a little shot at that, Brad. I mean, I'm, I'm a West Virginia native. I grew up in the coal fields. You know, my dad was a, dad was a coal miner. Um, and, you know, an understanding that, you know, fo folks recognize, you know, the transition. They recognize, you know, the middle of what we're in. So, so I don't think the, the pushback that I see in the communities I'm, you know, friends in, the people I know around the state, it isn't about this pushback on the transition. It's a, it's a pushback on, you know, losing who we are, like in our communities, you know what I mean? It's, it's talking about, you know, folks want, want to be able to go do work that they feel, you know, happy about at the end of the day, that they feel they have accomplished something and they've contributed to. That's where that pride in these industries kind of comes from. And saying that, you know, they're resistant, where they're resistant to, you know, nuking all of that history and all of that, you know, kind of legacy that folks are built on and saying we're just going to walk away and do something completely different. And, you know, I, and, and we, we've struggled with that sometimes. You know, folks come in and say they want West Virginia to look like insert your metro area here. And, and, and I don't know that that's necessarily what folks that live here want. They want opportunity. They want the ability to, you know, take care of their families and, and do good work. But there's a reason folks, again, why, why folks are sticky here is, you know, you can go out on the porch and you watch a sunset. We don't have to listen, you know, we don't have to listen to the traffic and we don't have to, you know, fight congestion on the way home. And, and they, they like it here because of that. So, you know, so, so it, it is this sort of nuance in, you know, yes, we welcome the opportunity. That doesn't mean that, you know, we're trying to blow it all up and, you know, change the place into, you know, into a, a metro that it isn't. And, and I think sometimes that gets lost in the conversation. It's a great point. Yeah, that's, that's all, that's all well said, Sam. Um, I think too, you know, um, coal miners, I've, I've just I've been recently reading this over and over again, and I think somebody else alluded to it, you know, there maybe it was, well, it doesn't matter. Um, it, there's problem solvers, right? So, so their skills can transfer to a lot of, of different areas. So that, that's one point. The other point I wanted to make in, in a very real way, uh, the mining industry has already taken the hit, you know? And, and I think what Sam is alluding to is more of a, um, more of a spiritual and, and, and a pride issue, you know, that, um, that I think we could all, you know, learn from and and think about, you know, if we center these predominantly these men who have done this incredible work for the whole nation, um, we would be much better off than than dismissing them. Many of them are are not well um, at this point after they've mined. And um, one article I read was talking about whoever innovates to the point that coal mining is is safe. You know, in terms of black lung and things like that, that will be a real innovation. And as if West Virginia continues to go down to the uh, coal or to products situation, we really do need to pay attention to miners' health. And I would encourage people on the call or anybody listening to think about that as well. It's a, a great point, Kelly. Um, Evan, I don't know if you if you had anything you wanted to add there. No, I don't. Okay. Well, so I think um, that's I think super helpful context as we sort of think about how to how to try to navigate this this transition. 
I think one of the things that we heard, and I think Stephanie mentioned this at the top, you know, one of the things companies talk about a lot, I think, and increasingly so, is they're setting net zero targets and sort of dealing with pressure from investors and sort of up and down the supply chain. Is that need to be able to procure clean electricity? And so I'm curious, and maybe this question is for Kelly, but obviously others are welcome to jump in. And some of the work that you're doing to try to attract new companies uh, or, or sort of growth in the state, what are some of the, uh, A, does that check out? And B, what are some of the other um, sort of priorities that you're hearing from folks at the, in terms of what they're looking for? It absolutely tracks. I mean, uh, we, we've heard Mike Graney, who um, is the uh, Deputy Director of the Department of Economic Development say it's no longer a nice to have, it's a, it's a must have. Um, so that is, is definitely something that, that we hear. And, and I do want to kind of give a shout out to some of the policy developments that Evan spoke of because, you know, we've, we've made some really significant steps forward in the past couple of years, most notably the um, power purchase agreement. Um, the ability for a building to contract with a solar installer and pay for the array and the electricity together. Um, that, that's just going to increase our um, rooftop solar. And, and I get a lot of calls, you know, I want to go solar. Is it going to be expensive? And, and I can say to them, honestly, now it's not as expensive as it was. So go for it. Um, the utility scale, um, streamline permitting, the RFPs opening up from our investor-owned utilities um, are all this. This permitting is also helping wholesale um, sellers on the PJM grid. So, so kudos to West Virginia. I would say that um, I don't know that companies know exactly what they're asking for. You know, sometimes they they might just be thinking um, a, a cleaner grid. But I think sometimes they're also thinking about, well, I want a solar array near me that I can get the electricity from. And currently that is not allowed. The, the shorthand for that is community solar. And I, you know, a lot of people think of that as you know, a, a solar array near a small town. Um, so I'm hopeful that, that we'll make a step there. Um, one of the benefits of that is um, multifamily units, you know, where there's a lot of people in one building and you can't really have enough solar on the roof to give everybody clean energy. Um, and also sometimes a lot of the residents in multifamily buildings are low and moderate income. So then you start talking about equity and you start talking about um, where the clean energy economy intersects with equity and some of the, the, the uh, poorest among us. And, and then finally, you know, doing this better is going to give us resiliency during power outages. You know, the more um, backup power or, or off-grid power that we can have, um, the better we're going to be positioned to deal with some of the catastrophic storms that are, are just getting worse, you know, at least in my lifetime. And hopefully we'll, we'll stop that at some point. Um, the other priorities from companies that want to come to West Virginia are sites. They they want sites already. To, you know they want them there. They want to be able to build them to suit. They also want um, workforce that's trained to do the jobs that they need them to do. Um, as I always do, I harp on the energy efficiency train. But um, I'm going to give a shout out to West Virginia University's Industrial Assessment Center. They um, do anything from um, lean manufacturing assessments to energy investment grade energy audits and things like that. And just so everybody knows, uh, Dr. Gopala, um, Dr. Gopala Krishnan um, was given a center of excellence award, um, the only one, the top IAC out of 32 nationwide. Great job, Gopala. So um, yeah, that, that's, that's where I stand on economic development. It's so that uh, thanks for that. I think that's um, it, it's it's good to sort of understand right it's sort of a baseline what it what it will take to bring companies to the state. I'm sort of curious. Um, and you mentioned workforce, um, and so you know the state has a lot of and again we, it's a theme that has been raised already just to kind of drill into a little bit more. There's a lot of deep expertise right in in both energy and manufacturing. What type of comparative advantage does that does that create for for the state in that sort of new, uh, you know, those and growing sort of growth sectors uh, in in a low carbon space? And maybe Sam, if you wanna if you wanna start us off there, but obviously 
uh, welcome comments from others. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a head start's a head start, right? So, so the advantage is is you know pretty obvious. You know, that our I alluded to it a little bit at the beginning. You know, our our expertise and knowledge in the subsurface, just from you know previous industries, talks a lot about you know being able to talk you know geothermal carbon sequestration. Um, if you're thinking about you know natural gas production for blue hydrogen, you know we're steeped in that. Uh, and then when you start to get into you know again large scale you know world scale you know chemical manufacturing around the state you know the the Kanawha Valley and you know Parkersburg and other parts of the state that that expertise you know that you know they're they're scientists and engineers you know they're they're a little bit agnostic as to what the feed is they just know what the product needs to be so you know talking to them about how processes can be updated how things can be changed to you know start to either you know reduce you know, carbon footprint or start to, you know, some of the stuff we're really interested in here at WBU research wise is, you know, how can we start to use carbon dioxide as a feedstock, um, you know, into these processes? How can I go, you know, carbon to chemicals, carbon to finished products? Um, you know, as a, all of that becomes something you can port into, you know, an industrial base that already exists, expertise that already exists. And in our conversations, you know, with various manufacturers around the state, you know, where, where I am in the Energy Institute is, is trying to put a bridge between the research work we do here and, you know, commercial folks, you know, in the, in the real world. Um, and, and we're hearing that pull. I mean, we can, we can say with a straight face that there is a lot of commercial demand interest in, you know, okay, tell me how I can make this product using CO2 as a way to then reduce my overall manufacturing footprint. You know, what, what other things can I do in my process to, you know, to start to reduce that footprint or use these different feedstocks? So, it, it, you know, right now, it's not even necessarily a question of industrial interest. Like we, we think you could deploy tech. It's, it's thinking about the R&D piece and just getting it to a, a technology level, you know, that's credible to start to go pilot and start to go deploy. And we're really, we're really interested in that. We've not been quiet, um, you know, with, with folks in Washington, with folks with the, uh, the interagency working group that, you know, that, that to us strikes us as a really natural fit of, you know, a, a technology that needs some investment because we already know there's demand pull for it. Where a lot of times it's, you know, we, we invent the thing and then try to figure out how to market it. Um, so, so this is a different one where, you know, we know the pool is there, we just need the solutions. And, you know, I think that, you know, that really speaks to, you know, that any place where you can have that head start, we have the base and we know the pool is there. That's usually the hard part in deploying these kinds of technologies. You know, it's the, the classic valley of death thing is the technology's here, where's all the demand? Um, you know, if, if we're already kind of like have folks on both ends of that bridge, then you know the valley becomes a lot easier to cross. So, all right, I'll freeze there. I could ramble on this all afternoon, Brad. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Kelly or or uh, Delegate Hansen. Any any comments? I think one of the questions, and I'll, I'll just I'll interject um, an audience question here. Is we've actually gotten a number of questions uh, from the audience, sort of on on the subject of equity. I think this sort of came up just a little bit. I think the the general, if I'll try to merge some questions together here, what does equity look like in West Virginia um, in the context of low carbon uh, development? And and that is, I think, you know, community solar is one of the things. And Kelly, you obviously talked about that. Uh, there there is a a bill in Congress that that would address uh, both community solar and and equity. So just would love to kind of hear from from the three of you. Um, sort of what your view of what that would look like and, and what it might take to actually be able to generate support uh, among you know the, either the federal delegation or at the state house to, to support those kinds of efforts. Oh boy, you've opened the mother load. This is something I am so interested in. Okay, equality is where four people, each one gets a bike, the same bike, same type of bike. Equity is where the short person gets a small bike the tall person gets a big bike. The person who can't use their legs gets one they can pedal with their hands. And the person with a child gets one with a car seat. So if equality is our goal, I don't think we have enough resources on the planet to give that to everybody, right? 
But if equity is our goal, then we start talking about things like energy efficiency and like what is a decent standard of living and who gets it and who doesn't get it. These call into question so many systemic issues about our culture in particular and the Western world versus the developing nations. And one thing that does, you know, the international, the intergovernmental panel on climate change, it's amazing what they're doing. They're not just trying to, to mitigate climate change. They're trying for an equitable solution to climate change because otherwise it's unfair, right? You know, the developing world sees the rest of us doing whatever the heck we want and they don't have access. So um, like, like I said, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Do I know how to solve it? Mm -mm. I know how to ask the questions. So any input on solving it, email me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could add a couple things. A little while ago, Kelly mentioned the power purchase agreement bill that we passed. And to me, that's related to this issue because what this means is that any homeowner has access to solar now, whether or not they have ten or twenty thousand dollars in the bank that they could use as a down payment on it. And not only could they access solar, but they could immediately reduce their electric bills with no upfront investment. So that's I think that there's an equity component there. Um, it also ties in with what the interagency working group and the cold community work group are doing. It's because there's a recognition that there are communities that have um, worked so hard for so many years, people that have worked so hard for so many years, and that it's actually appropriate to, um, if they're gonna be impacted even more through this transition to a low carbon future, it's appropriate to direct even more resources into those communities to make sure they could thrive. And like Sam said, they could have jobs, people could have jobs that they're proud of and they'll work hard. People wanna work hard, people wanna earn, earn a living and support their families. And it's, it's gonna be a challenge to diversify some of these local economies that have depended solely on coal for generations. Um, but that's an equity issue as well. So I, I think to sort of tie back a thread that I think came up a little bit earlier, which is around resilience, right? Because there's certainly an equity component there as well when we think about the impacts of, of climate change, um, and in particular on, on you know, communities that lower and moderate income, vulnerable communities generally. I'm sort of curious how, you know, what kinds of resilience efforts have, have really sort of uh, uh, kind of gotten off the ground, if you will, in the state and, and sort of what, what do you think the needs are from a resilience perspective? And I'll offer that to anyone who wants to take it. I don't mind taking a stab. You know, every West Virginian pretty much was impacted by the derecho of a few years ago. Around here, we call it the derecho. Um, but uh, what it did was neighborhoods all across West Virginia went out and bought natural gas generators. And boy, wouldn't it be great if we had some solar plus storage generators to help people through, you know, outages and things like that. I mean, these, this is, is, would be new to a lot of us, you know, because it, if, if you've lost your power for any people, some people were out of power for six weeks. My boss was one of them back in the day. And, uh, you know, he had enough means to go to a hotel if he wanted to, but there's people who don't. So that's, that's where I'll stop. Yeah, and, and Evan may have some of this, you know, on the policy side, you know, I, I th this thinking about this, this resilience and, and how we can, you know, kill a couple birds <laughs> with with one stone is some of the work we're trying to do here that, you know, tries to hit these things on resilience and equity and diversification, um, you know, trying to think about how we can come up with solutions that hit that. And so some of the things we've been looking at are, uh, you know, we talked right at the very top about physical built infrastructure and how you get, you know, customer density problems. And some of the things we've been working with, with, with some utility partners and, and folks here in, in our part of the state about, can we jump out and do, you know, solar with storage installations on remote sites? So if you think about our, our grid, a lot of our grid is spoken wheel looking. So, you know, you get centralized generation, but then the lines kind of run up a hollow. And if you drop a tree at the head of the hollow, everybody above it is out of power. 
Um, so some of the things we've been thinking about, can we jump at the other end, do some things that are for like overall grid resilience, things with storage and power conditioning, but in bad weather, can I start to, you know, maybe generate and have storage that then provides backup power, you know, backfeed that circuit. And, and it has some co-benefits of, you know, where it is in the community. And can we start to maybe look at, you know, brownfield or former mine sites, which tend to be in some of these places. So we're, we're trying to do some work that, you know, really maximizes that investment dollar, whether that's from a, you know, from a utility um, you know, or a state agency that's interested in, you know, climate and weather resilience, disaster resilience, you know, or even a, up at the federal level. So, I mean, but, but those are the kinds of things we're having to try to do. You know, again, you know, Stephanie kind of hit it off the top. If I'm, if I'm trying to compete against a large metro area for, you know, for impact, I've got to show like, you know, depth of impact, you know, that I'm, I'm going to take your, your dollar and I'm going to get $10 worth of value out of it in, you know, economic impact, labor impact, grid resilience, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, you know, that for better or worse, that's the climb we're kind of used to here, but that's that's what we're doing um, in ter terms of trying to address some of these things. Another aspect of resilience is just the, the built infrastructure and uh, how vulnerable that is to impacts from climate change. You know, we have a, a relatively new state office of resiliency and uh, which is good they're working on uh, cataloging this infrastructure and doing hazard mitigation planning and things like that but the question i have is is you know are we being realistic about how the future climate is not going to match the past climate and do we have accurate assessments of the the bridges and the hospitals and homes and businesses that are at risk now that weren't at as much risk in the past. And so, you know, it's a statewide issue, but it's also impacting us on the local level. I mentioned the floods here in Morgantown over the summer and Morgantown Utility Board, which, which maintains, operates our stormwater system and wastewater as well. You know, they're, they're embarking on a study now to uh, understand what they can do now that the hundred year storm is no longer the hundred year storm. And as, as far as I know, this is the first municipality in West Virginia that's doing this. It, I, if anyone knows someone else who's ahead of us, let me know. Uh, but this is very real and it's not gonna just be Morgantown. You know, communities across the country have already taken on this issue. Um, and it's, it's not easily solved because these are, these are this is infrastructure that costs you know, tens to hundreds of millions of dollars to address, and some of which was put in place you know, decades or 100 years ago. And so these are, these are big issues that we're facing now. But the fact that, that at least in Morgantown and hopefully other communities, we're, we're finally acknowledging the reality of where we are and starting to plan for it, that's, that's a positive step. Yeah, and I'll, I'll put in a plug for a, um, a study that um, our office is funding. It's a microgrid study, and we're going to use SEPA, the Smart Electric Power Alliance, to take a look at what you know where microgrids would best be suited in emergency situations. Um, that work will it, well started October first, and will continue for the federal year. And of course, then after that, it becomes sort of like the geothermal mine pool work I was talking about earlier. You know, you find out where things are and then you have to figure out, you know, where you want to get the most bang for your buck and, and, and things like that. So um, to that end, too, as we look at this influx of potential federal money, especially through the U.S. Department of Energy, we're trying, you know, we have to sort of target everything we plan to do to, back to energy resilience and um, one of the programs that I'm going to really try and get started is a pervious paver, paver program because a lot of the, some of the flooding in some of our towns is because they're just covered in concrete, right? So if you put in pervious pavers, that water can percolate down instead of collecting. So um, looking forward to some of that work. Because you know your top top of the line question, Brad, was you know what is being done, and and I, I think um, you know probably some campuses and hospitals are they've just taken it upon themselves to be ready in in a situation, but uh, I don't know about our our towns themselves. 
Yes. So you mentioned, you know, some of those potential investments, right? Um, and that's, I think, come up. And obviously, again, that is a little bit of, of the, you know, uh, inconspicuous backdrop to, to this conversation. Are, are there specific priorities that you would, you know, sort of, if you were to identify, right, you sort of top like one or two priorities for those kinds of investments, where would you, where would you suggest focusing them? Hmm. I know where I would focus, and that would be on the vegetation management plan for um, the entire state. Right now, that's that's funded through ratepayers, and there's not nearly enough money. And all it's going to take is a drought, a spark, and we're going to see some devastation. Wouldn't necessarily be like California because we don't have the same kind of trees, but um, I I really think that is critical. And using using taxpayer money plus ratepayer money to get at this huge issue, I think would be a really interesting um, way to go. I have heard that there, one of the things you can do with the grid is you can put sensors at certain special places. And if there is a drought condition, the sensors turn off, you know, so there's no chance of sparking. So we've got, you know, sort of two technologies here, the very simple but expensive vegetation management and, and the more complex um, you know, turning off parts of the grid in, in bad situations. So that is, that's my number one. Sam, anything, uh, if you, you know, if you could wave a magic wand and, and direct some federal resources, any, any thoughts on where you'd, you'd put them? Oh my goodness. Um, it's, it's such a list, Brad. Uh, you know, some of these things around, you know, around resilience and, you know, and, and climate stuff. I mean, we've been talking about, we talk about it for a while, you know, I, I've seen five, 500 or thousand year floods in the last, you know, five or six years, you know, so, you know, one of the things I know that's been out there and it's fairly low hanging is we've talked with our, our friends and colleagues out at the, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, where they, you know, they've been trying to get some study work done on, you know, just flood, flood plain study and, you know, what does that mean for like big, big infrastructure, flood control type stuff. Um, that, you know, that becomes a big one. Uh, you know, other, other things that, you know, in, in terms of the federal priorities, you know, just all this stuff around built infrastructure. You know, we talked, you know, some about equity, you know, and the different things for that. And, you know, things like, you know, figuring out intelligent ways to maybe solve broadband that don't involve running copper to every house. You know, things, things we can talk about around, you know, electrical, electric vehicle charging. You know, my, my fear, I guess, is the word I'll use. You know, a lot of folks, again, the socioeconomic kind of baseline in West Virginia, you know, folks are not going to go out and be buying new Teslas. You know, so, so the, the demand on the charging infrastructure when that starts to roll out here is going to be higher than folks are used to because folks are going to be buying probably used vehicles. You know, and, you know, if you think about range degradation, you know, on, you know, electric vehicle batteries we see today, you know, so, so you take, you know, these kinds of things and you say, you know, when it does start to roll out here, where's the underpinning to support, you know, to support folks even just in their day-to-day -day lives. And that's going to be really tough to do just through the, the private sector. You know, it's, it's frustrating, I think, from where we're standing, but it's understandable, you know, if you're, you know, if you're a, an EV you know, a blink or someone like that shows up and says, well, you know, do, do I go six miles up this hollow to put a charger in for four people, you know, and, and I have no idea when they may buy an electric car, <laughs> you know, that, that becomes tough. And, and that's, that becomes a role for, you know, more federal type investment, you know, just, just looking historically, how does that infrastructure get built? So that, that's where I think I would go. Big, big infrastructure projects are huge for us. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a great point. And, and Evan, I know you already sort of spoke to this a little bit at, at the top. So um, happy to, if, if you wanted to add more there, but I might uh, sort of give you a different sort of a different twist on this, this question, uh, in part because, you know, carbon pricing is, has been a topic that has sort of resurfaced in, in federal climate policy discussions uh, of late. Um, and so, and, and I think that's been mostly in a, a sort of a pay for context, sort of how do you fund a lot of these investments while still, you know, working to reduce emissions alongside them. We don't have a ton of details at this point in terms of what that that program might look like, but just in general, how do you think carbon pricing would affect 
uh, the folks in, in West Virginia? And, and are there any design sort of approaches or elements that you think really stand out as important to you? Well, carbon pricing is a pretty touchy issue in West Virginia, probably for obvious reasons. You know, despite the downturn in the coal industry, there's still a lot of jobs, a lot of economic activity that's tied to fossil fuels, coal and gas. Um, and the carbon price is, is designed to reduce fossil fuel use. That's it's a policy instrument to do that. Um, so I think for, for a carbon price to work in West Virginia, it has to be designed to send funds back to people and to communities. So there have been proposals out there for a dividend that goes back to every household, um, including those in West Virginia. And so it would be interesting to uh, know what those amounts are. And you know, I think that politically, if you were trying to sell, say, a carbon tax with a dividend where the money is going back to every every household in West Virginia, that may be an easier sell than the, the CEPP policy, which is sending money to the utilities, you know, these multi-billion dollar industries that already have a lot of money. You know, why not send the money back to the people? But in addition to a dividend, there's also proposals out there that include additional money that goes back to coal and power plant communities that are disproportionately impacted. So this gets back to that idea of how to support those communities as the transition is going on. So I think you know, we would need to see both of those, or I would need to see both of those, dividend that goes back to people and then additional resources for the coal and power plant communities. Thanks for that. Um... I mean, to put you on the spot, just, you know, have to have to ask, I think uh, at this point, we've got about 20 minutes left. So I want to sort of open it up for some audience questions. And we've gotten a number of good ones already. Um, one of them, and I know this is, again, this was something that came up in the roundtable and we've talked about a little bit today, but just to sort of delve in a little bit more deeply. So, you know, West Virginia, uh, WVU, Marshall and other universities are graduating a lot of people with STEM degrees, but there aren't necessarily enough opportunities for all of them in the state. How, do, how can you make sure that those opportunities exist? Uh, and is it is it really just as simple as, you know, trying to encourage more companies uh, to, to move to West Virginia? I'll jump in. I mean, I'm, I've been in the economic development world for more than 20 years now. And I, I would say that one of the answers has to be entrepreneurship. You know, you've got to have people, you know, if they're quote unquote smart enough to have STEM degrees, you know, where's the fire in the belly to do something about whatever problem that the society is facing. Um, and, and we're very fortunate in, in our state to have a outstanding small business development center. And, you know, they are a great resource for people who, who, who want to, un, you know, have a good idea or, or you know, maybe don't have the greatest idea, but have a desire. Um, I, I wish I could remember the URL, but that, that's a good place to start. Um, I mean, you know, we, can, we, we just can't simply continue to rely on other people to, to save our bacon. You know, we're, we're gonna have to do some of that here. And, and that goes back to sort of a, a dispirited population, right? You know, I mean, thing, things are tough and Corona has not, helped you know so um i don't know i always preach empathy and i always try and talk about um well okay i'm going to drop my quote the uh the sun magazine there was an article by s b Rowe, and in it he kind of distilled the work of father gregory boyle who um has a book called tattoos on the heart where he works with prison populations and, and what he says is we need to deal with this lurking suspicion that some people are worth less than others. And that really has hit me hard and been resonating through all of our discussions, you know, and equity and um, the, the way uh, our work lives are set up. You know, not everybody wants to work because maybe they don't necessarily fit the nine to five or whatever. Some people cannot work. You know, where, where are we considering things like that? Um, and again, no answers here, mostly questions, but 
that's what your question triggered in me. Thanks. Sam or yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll take a shot just because I guess we're we're trying to graduate a lot of those STEM folks up here. And and you know, that is something that in you know my classes, my lectures around campus, you know, interactions with students. Um, the entrepreneurship angle is huge. It's absolutely monstrous. And, and trying to convince them that, you know, you've got the skills and, you know, the, there's a need in the community. Uh, WVU has put resources, you know, toward that. We have a couple different big operations here at the university focused on enabling entrepreneurship and startup support. And, you know, how can we connect, you know, undergrad students through to if they've got a business idea, how can we support them? Um, so there, there's a lot in that. The other thing that I've been trying to make sure our students recognize is that, you know, that entrepreneurship can be in a lot of sectors. I think that a lot of our, our students that show up here and they're, you know, getting a degree in STEM fields tend to think that it's all, you know, it's medicine or energy production. And, you know, th there's a lot of support work around that, you know, in, in energy production, there's whole lanes, whole industries in environmental, you know, environmental protection, environmental monitoring, and all these kinds of things that if you've got a good idea, if you've got good technology, there's going to be an opportunity for you to start something that has, you know, a room to grow in the state and then, you know, and then room to grow in the region. So, so it's a combination of, you know, supporting, you know, our students early, getting them going, and then, you know, helping them understand the landscape, you know, maybe not, is not as narrow as they're used to thinking about it. Um, you know, that it, it can't just be something about, you know, a different way to do a fossil industry in a small market, you know, in, in West Virginia. It, you can think bigger than that, and there are lots of avenues around that. So that's, again, I, that's right in a space I'm having to do as part of the day job here is, is how do we engage students and then figure out a way to keep them inside the fence, so to speak. Thanks for that. Evan, did you have anything you wanted to, to add there? So, um, so thank you for that. And I think the entrepreneurship discussion is, is I think, a really important one. Um, one of the other sort of a, to, to move on to a, a different topic that came up from from one of our audience uh, members who is a who works for a company uh, evaluating and purchasing carbon credits uh, and is a, a Charleston native. Uh, and wanted to ask whether or not you're sort of aware of any organized groups or frameworks for developing CCUS in West Virginia, and sort of noting in particular uh, excitement around the growth of voluntary carbon markets and what that could mean for the state, uh, both in terms of you know, potential in forests, but also potentially storage of carbon captured in saline basins. So uh, I'll open that up uh, again for anyone who wants to, to take it. I'll, I'll crash into it just because that's where a lot of my direct work's trying to go. So th there are some, you know, emerging things around forest. We'll start with the easier one first. Uh, you know, the, the forest carbon markets, some of the bio biologic carbon markets. There are some active things happening in West Virginia. There are already some organizations in, in timber and things like that tied in with nationwide carbon markets. That's tricky to get small consumers tied into, but at least there's a, a model and a footprint for that in the state. And we know that some of our friends over at the, uh, the Nature Conservancy and, and around the state have been looking at, uh, you know, family forest type initiatives to where we can start to bring smaller landowners together in these sort of, you know, more voluntary carbon market kind of aspects. So we've been engaged in that. And we've got some research and support work um, happening here at WVU for how, how do you set those up and what does that mean? Um, the, the more industrial kind of capture becomes a lot trickier uh, today. So, I mean, it's, it's bigger money, it's bigger capital. Um, and, and candidly, there are some things in the, you know, in the regulatory and policy space that just aren't really well defined that we kind of see as a barrier to some of these, you know, to some of these projects right now. Like, you know, we, we've looked about whether you could do these projects. We understand the state has made uh, some, you know, very foot forward moves already around enabling stuff for carbon sequestration in terms of the, the class six well permitting, which is really down in the, the nerdy weeds here. Um, but, but, you know, those are necessary steps, but we still have fundamental questions around, you know, who do I have to go talk to to establish a lease to store carbon? You know, who, who owns the space? Do 
Do I have to work with the surface owner or the subsurface owner or both? Um, and it's not terribly clear, at least from where we stand today. Um, so that, that makes that whole network, you know, tons of opportunity, but we, but we do need to get some, you know, legislative and policy support on that. Um, and that I was not at all trying to just serve a softball up for Evan in that statement there. So. <laughs> Well, yeah, it'd be good to clarify that. And I understand we also need to clarify who owns the heat for, for geothermal. And so that's something that we could certainly try to move forward on next session or as soon as we legislators understand the issue well enough to write a bill. <laughs> so we need your help on that. Um, I mean, there's other kinds of markets, right? Like there's, there's rec markets, the renewable energy credit markets. And we in the energy committee meeting that we had, just a few weeks ago, there was a presentation by the operators of the Summersville Dam. And it, it was an interesting presentation. It was also very direct in the sense that they said, here are our asks at the end. So it was very helpful to know exactly what they're asking for. And one of their asks was specifically to have a rec market in West Virginia. And, you know, that's when, when the legislature undid the renewable and Alternative and renewable portfolio standard five or so years ago, you know, that we lost the framework for that. So we're going to have to take action to, to implement RECs in West Virginia. But what that means is that, you know, some of these types of electricity generation are, are less competitive in West Virginia compared to surrounding states. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Evan. I mean, is that is that an area for innovation? I mean, we tried a renew alternative or renew renewable portfolio standard, and it, it got kicked out. Um, maybe there's another way. I mean, is there another way to skin that issue? Hopefully, there is. I, you know, I think we need to see what comes out from the federal level over the next month because that may address it. But if mm. federal legislation doesn't address it, then we need to really think about how West Virginia is being left behind by the actions of all of our neighbors and how we can have state policy that at least allows us to share you know, some portion of those benefits. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. And I think as others sort of pointed to that, that need for regulatory certainty was something that, again, Stephanie mentioned this at the top, came up a lot during the conversation, which is really just about making sure that companies know that they're sort of hedging and managing risk as they make you know, significant investments uh, in, in nascent industries that, that those risks are gonna be sort of managed. Uh, we are, are coming up on time here. Just one more audience question uh, I'll sort of pose to the group. And maybe since it's the last one, I'll ask everyone to, to weigh in. But sort of in your work in this space, what do you think the, the secret has been to progress? And, and especially, I think really importantly here, what are things that other states could take away and learn from, from what has been working in West Virginia? Well, if no one else wants to go first, I, I mean, I've been trying to do two things at the same time over the last couple of years. One is to actually talk openly about climate change, because I think that debate or that yeah, that debate has been missing in the legislature. Um, so on the one hand, talk openly about it so it could be sort of normalized and you, know, you don't have to be afraid to say those words anymore. On the other hand, and this seems like the opposite of it, is that when there's particular policies that are up for consideration that have a real chance of passing, you don't necessarily have to talk about climate change because there's other benefits. Um, and people, you know, climate change still is a difficult thing to talk about here. So the, the bills that were passed related to, to solar, the, the utility solar bill, the PPA bill, the one that removed the punitive tax. Those were not debates about climate change. Those were debates about bringing jobs and economic development to the state. And so that's worked really well and helped build a consensus to get stuff done. Yeah, I would, I would have said the same thing. You know, a lot, a lot of our work and what we've had success is, is in reaching out into the communities and understanding, you know, kind of on the ground, you know, the, the problem, you know, what is the problem? And it may not be what you, what you think it is going in, um, you know, and so being, you know, willing to have that discussion. I mean, some of the stuff, you know, Brett, we talked about right at the top, you know, it's a non-intuitive barrier, you know, when you start talking to the communities, it's like, boy, this is fantastic that there's all these resources being made at the federal government. 
I still can't access them because of match or I still can't access them because of the, you know, just administrative horsepower to run these things. And, and that becomes a whole different set, you know, the, you know, the thinking maybe going in was, well, we've got, all we got to do is, you know, make the money available. And it, you know, and then you get into the frustrating thing. It's like, that doesn't solve all the problems. So, you know, I think, you know, getting into the communities, having really open dialogue with folks there and, and understanding again, you know, we, we talked about at the top that sometimes these issues, you know, are, are more complicated in the sense that there's a today problem. There's a, you know, there's someone hungry, there's some, you know, there's a problem that needs solved today. I'm not worried about, you know, this transformational goal somewhere down the road. Is there something that can be done that lets us, you know, start to address them both simultaneously? And, and I think maybe, you know, the, the talking about how do we transfer lessons from West Virginia out, that sometimes gets a little, a little tricky. Um, but that, that might be, you know, the best place to, to say that is, you know, where can you look at a problem and think about there's a, an on the ground community need and we, we can address that and set ourselves up for long term success. Is, is something again we're, we're starting to get pretty good at and I think other folks could maybe start to start to think about. I, I couldn't have said it better Sam so I won't try. <laughs> well I, I just really have appreciated this discussion and and want to just say thank you again to all of our our panelists for joining us today um, and uh, also note that the recording will be on YouTube uh in the next 24 hours so uh so make sure to, to to check it there so you can relive this riveting discussion um but with that i, I want to say uh and, and also of course share with your friends um because uh who you know i think obviously everybody you know could benefit from from i think the insight that that our speakers provided us with today so uh so thanks again uh to, to everyone for joining us uh, we appreciate the time and uh go read the brief thanks so much <laughs>